Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Quiet, numbskulls. I'm broadcasting. Can we get serious now? One thing that did happen during the 60s was some music of an unusual or experimental nature did get recorded and did get released. Now look at who the executives were in those companies at those times. Not hip young guys. These were cigar chomping old guys who looked at the product that came and said, I don't know. Who knows what it is? Record it. Stick it out of it. sells all right. We were better off with those guys than we are now with the supposedly hip young executives who are making the decisions of what people should see and hear in the marketplace. Success in the music business begins with a dream, a vision. This podcast will give you, the listener, the insight and tools to turn that vision into a reality. Meet the industry professionals who work day by day behind the scenes, helping to make those dreams come true. Welcome to the business side of music. Here's an interesting scenario we have going on today. We've never done this before, so let's hope we pull it off. In the studio with us here in Nashville, Tennessee, today is Nicole Hoagland, who's the executive director of MCR Crowdfund. Welcome to the show. Welcome. Thank you. And then all the way from New York City via Zoom, we're going to hope this works today, is uh, Carl Alaka, who is the CEO. Carl, welcome to the show. Uh, Thanks, Bob. Nice to meet you. So let's talk about MCR Crowdfund. But before we do, let's talk about how you two got together, because that's the reason that MCR Crowdfund is is in existence, right? Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Who wants to take the helm here? Do you want me to take the helm? You can start, Nicole. <laughs> Speak better than I do anyway. I just have that New York accent that... Yeah, you're fun. You bring the fun. So Carl and I have known each other for about six, seven years now. We met doing a different venture in Nashville together with another person. And through that, we learns and we realize that throughout the music community, artists need a way to fund their projects. And Carl, being the web genius that he is, realized that there was a way to do this without necessarily having to invest a whole ton of money into an app and really create a way for independent music artists to fan fund any type of music project that they want within the indie space and not have it be a Kickstarter where you may get lost in the sauce because there's so many campaigns going on or other platforms that may not necessarily cater to music artists. So over the last six years, we've been able to help artists. I believe there's like 50 from the other venture that we've been able to help. But in the end of last year, we decided to kind of go out on our own and do something a little bit different than what the other company was doing. And that's kind of how Carl and I were able to start up MCR Crowdfund. Do both of you have a music career background? I do not. Carl does, though. So I'm going to have Carl t- talk about that. i an ex-artist. I've had record deals and, you know, this, this and that. You know, I'm an artist myself. And the reason why I started this is that I see the music business changing. It was changed. And now pretty much a lot of the gatekeepers are gone, you know. And uh, like right now, you, like back in the day, you needed... Um, you know, a label to get your music out there. You need a publisher to get it, you know, put out there. You need a radio to get it, you know, put out in there. Today, you don't need any of that. Today, you know, you could go and, you know, with, with technology and software is inexpensive. You can record really quality music yourself. You can get it up on Spotify, you know, iTunes, whatever yourself. You can like do pretty much everything yourself. All you kind of need is money to kind of like fund these projects, you know, and that's basically what all the labels have become pretty much now anyway just basically venture capitalist. So we found out because of technology and the internet and social media, artists now can grow their own fan base and like raise money themselves and do it all themselves and have really good quality careers on their own, you know, their own dime, you know? So, and that's where it started. You know, the idea of it started. How is MCR crowdfund? How do you separate that from Kickstarter or Indiegogo or any of the other crowdfundings out there? But how are different is this Kickstarter, Indiegogo, GoFundMe, all those, they're pretty much just listing sites. Anybody in the, and their brother can put up a, a GoFundMe or a Kickstarter campaign, you know, without and just put up there and put anything they want and do anything they want and get lost in the shuffle because Kickstarter, you know, caters to like, you know, movies, guys want to make movies, got to have inventions, guys who do music, guys who do medical things. So there's just a whole array of stuff. And if you don't get your money, if you don't meet your goal, you know, you don't get paid and it's just kind of a waste of time and you get lost in their shop where we're curated and nuanced to music artists, because I think it's different, you know, music artists have a different kind of needs and we, 
And through the years of the last thing we did together, through those years, we've realized how, what to ask for, how to ask for it, and what to do with the money once you get it. And uh, just basically how to do it right so it's successful. You know, the, the, the company we worked with before had about an 85% success rate, whereas for music projects, whereas Indiegogo, GoFundMe, had more like an 18 to 20% success rate for music artists. So, because we know what we're doing in that particular field, you know, so it's, it's very but different, you know, I think it's, we're curated and we're nuanced. Well, and I think to add to that too, any artist that we work with, we have a conversation with before them. So before they can even get on the platform and launch a campaign, we talk with them about what their goals are and what they want to do and how they want to go about doing it. Because we can tell very easily from a conversation if this artist is really going to be invested in it or if they're going to need a little bit more handholding to get their campaign going. And on top of that, we also work with them after and make sure that they're investing that money in the way that they wanted to and hopefully opening up doors for them if they don't necessarily have the connections they want to, to get out that music project. And you brought up what I think are a couple important questions, which one, going about raising the money, do they have an idea or do you help them assimilate the information on how much money they need to raise? And then the second part of that question is, what do they do with it? Do you help them focus and spend the money wisely in the directions where it needs to be spent? So a lot of the times artists will come to us and they'll say, I need to raise $5,000 because I want to release a 10 track EP or something like that. And we work with them to kind of narrow that down in the terms of, okay, so for $5,000, here's realistically what you can get. If you want to do this, you may need to raise this much more. But we also work with them on how big their fan base is. We've kind of figured out throughout the years that however many fans you have, so let's say you have 5,000 fans, you could expect to raise a dollar per fan. So if you have a lofty goal of, I need $30,000 to get in the studio and hire this really awesome producer. You have and 11 Facebook fans. And, and you have 11 Facebook fans, you probably aren't going to be able to raise that. Now, there have... Yes, right. There, and there have been cases where someone's come in and we've said, you know, we don't know if you'll actually be able to raise it, but we'll see what happens. And they've surpassed their goal and they've kind of proven us wrong. But a lot of the times we work with them to have realistic expectations so that they, one, do raise their money and hopefully go past that, but also don't necessarily get like kind of beaten down by it because crowdfunding does take a lot of time and effort and mentally it can wear artists down if they're not seeing the progress they want fast enough. So. And I'm glad you brought that up, too, because when we talk about seeing the progress, quick results, we, we live in that instant gratification world now where everything's at the at our fingertips. Uh, you can microwave a meal in 30 seconds. You can listen to music immediately. That crowdfund campaign that we're talking about, typically how long would something like that run? Is it based on, maybe I should say, do you base it on the amount of money they're trying to raise or is there a certain time frame or does it get old after a while if you're not reaching the amount quickly enough? I mean, I would say, Carl, we normally let them go between 30 and 45 days. Okay. The average, anything longer than that, yeah, it's kind of like if you, if you don't get to where you want to go within a month and a half or a month, you're pretty much, your fan base is not responding to you. Then you might have to reassess, you know, what you're doing, you know? So usually about 30 days, I'd say is the average. Yeah. And it, we normally don't necessarily base it on the amount of money that they raise just because we know that first week that they launch a campaign and then the last week that they launch the campaign are the two weeks where they're really going to raise the most amount of money because the first week they're pushing it. It's new to their it's new to their fans. And then the last week they're really pushing it and their fans are really rooting for them. It's that middle time frame where if they're not really into promoting it, that they can get into like that lull of my fans aren't donating. I'm not seeing the needle move. So we really help them in reminding them to be consistent about promotion because a lot yeah, of with, that- with like kickstarter and those other ones there's no one there to guide you they have like you know a lot of like faq you know pages on their websites you know what to do but we'll actually talk to these people and say listen this is what you're not doing this is what you should be doing you know we know that well, this works because this is the experience we've had this is what what you're doing is not working because and this will work if and you know we help guide them and the ones that take our direction they succeed. And that's another thing, too, dealing with artists sometimes. I hate to say it. Some of them just think you can put up a campaign, throw it up there. Okay, guys, I'm up. Send me money. And they leave it alone. They don't promote it. 
and then it just falls flat. You know, that's that's part of it, too. We, we show them that they need to work this like it's a real thing, like not like just some second tier thing. So anyway. And the way that we at least I try to reframe it with artists is for the next 30 days, crowdfunding is your job. Like you, you may have a side job where you do things. You may have singles that are launching. But for the next 30 days, you need to concentrate and give most of your energy to this campaign. And when you do, you see the needle move forward. You see the success. You raise the money and then you get to do that project. So, yeah. And I think that's the other thing, too, is I had a conversation with a young artist today and he wanted to know, man, you know, things are just kind of stale and I said are you hustling are you getting out there and 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 doing the hustle and he goes well I'm just kind of hoping things would fall into place so you really as that artist it's not all up to Nicole and Carl it's the artist has to get in there put the time and the effort Mm -hmm. that's true I mean we give them the place to host their actual campaign and we give them the guidance but we can't force them to hit post on a, a, a social media post or you know send an email to their email fan base so those are the things that they do have to do themselves. But for them, you know, $5,000, $10,000, $20,000, it's not a small sum of money. So really being able to understand and attach to that and know that that's your accomplishment, I think helps artists see too, like, of course I have to hustle for this. I'm only going to make, you know, maybe $100 tip wise at the waitressing job I have. But if I push this, I can make $5,000 in 30 days, which is more than they probably made in the last, you know, 20. So part of the problem too with artists, I'm finding because I think this is the future, you know, even though it's been around a while, it still hasn't been fully adopted by the, the artist, the musician, the artist community, because a lot of them think it's like begging for money. They don't get it. What they're doing is just basically cutting out the middleman. They're just going directly to the fan base, say, listen, help me bring you my new music. Help me, you know, bring you my new video. So so if you can get over that stigma of that, they're not begging their, these people for money. They're just asking them to help them, which has been around since busking, since, I don't know, the, the, the Bible days, you know, like people have been, you know, the artists have been, you know, being benefactors and stuff, having benefactors. So, yeah, because we have we have a few artists that we know that like a few a thousand fan based fan and they raised one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So this is this can be a serious game changer for your career if you work it right. That's what we're trying to get across to these people. In the studio with us today, Nicole Hoagland, who is the executive director and long distance via Zoom, New York City, Carl Alaka, who is the CEO, MCR Crowdfund. You're listening to the business side of music. When you have a Korg synth at your fingertips, the possibilities are endless. Be it digital, analog, analog modeling, altered FM, wave sequencing, or the multi-engine synth. Korg gives you easy access to a variety of features to help you get the perfect sounds quickly. Whether you're a professional musician or just starting out, Korg truly has a synthesizer to help you express yourself. Visit Korg.com or your favorite Korg dealer to get your hands on one of their products to create new music always. Korg, the official sponsor of the business side of music. Hi everyone, I'm Larry Butler, and I want to send you a free digital copy of my new book, the Singer-Songwriter Rulebook, 101 Ways to Help You Improve Your Chances of Success. That's right, everything you need to know to launch your career as a singer-songwriter, all based on my 40 years in the live performance arena, and believe me, I've seen it all. In my book, you'll find the 10 things you have to deal with before even thinking about becoming a singer-songwriter-performer. You'll also learn about the five things every singer-songwriter can do this weekend to make their live show better. Five things I can guarantee that you are not doing already. Plus, there's tips on songwriting and staging, photo and video shoots, publishing, merch, dozens of other topics, all written for people who don't particularly like to read. And again, it's free. Just go to the Business Side of Music website homepage and look for my book cover. Click on it, and a free digital copy of my book will be yours. I'm Larry Butler, and I approve of this message. You're listening to the Business Side of Music. Back in the studio with us, Nicole Hoagland, who's the executive director and long distance from New York, Carl Alaka, who is the CEO, MCR Crowdfund. When we talk about crowdfunding and to a certain extent, it and I agree with what 
Carl said, the gatekeepers of the record business, they're, they're gone. Mm-hmm. You know, someone asked me the other day, would I be interested in getting back in, into the record business? I'm too old. I, I think probably the average age of anybody working there now is probably in their 30s, early 40s. And the old school's gone, and the old way of doing business is gone. And, you know, when I was in the business, we didn't have crowdfunding. Crowdfunding mm-hmm. didn't exist. It's it's relatively new based on, on the spectrum of, of the record business, the music business. But at the same time, it is a tool. It's a viable tool. What type of artist fits into being a successful crowdfunder? Does that make sense? I mean, I would say... Any, like any independent, well, I, I mean, not any. But does it's, the, it's does the, the indi- music need to be commercially viable or does it just need to be good? No, you so need a in, fan base. It really, yeah, it depends on your fan base. So it's really any indie artist. So if you have a record deal already and you're, obviously, you're getting money from those places, you probably don't need to crowdfund. But it, as an independent artist, it doesn't necessarily me- need to be the quality of the music you're putting out there. It's the quality of your fan base. So if you've taken the time to build up your fan base and get to know them and get them excited about the projects that you're doing and they're interacting with you, they will be the key to having you be a successful crowdfunding artist because they're the ones that are going to open up their wallets and say, sure, for $5, I'll skip my you know latte <laughs> from Starbucks today right. and I'll help you put out your latest single or your latest album because I really do believe in your career so it's not necessarily about the quality of the artist it's the quality of the fan base so let's back up for a second the dollar amount the average dollar Mm -hmm. amount that a fan would give to their artist is what i would say a dollar you know what we i think i think what you say we've somehow figured out that basically the ratio seems to work out that for every fan you have in your social media you can raise a dollar so it's like, you know, but what I think the average, the average fan will pay around $10, you know, give you $10 or, or $20, you know, so that's kind of the average donation. If that's what you're asking. But one thing also good, just to jump a little bit, one thing good about crowdfunding, that's almost ironic. Not only does it help you as an indie artist, but what it does is because labels today, how they're gauging new artists is basically on their fan base and their inter and, and, their, and their activity with their fans on socials, like, you know, TikTok or or I know an artist that we know just got signed because of her TikTok engagement, you know? So, but what it does, what crowdfunding does to help that is like, so if you have 10,000 fans, let's say, on your Instagram, and you get like, you know, your certain amount of likes every post, it's great. But likes and like follows don't mean anything really. But when you have the 10,000 fans and they're engaging enough to donate to your campaign, it shows these labels and these publishers that their fan base is engaged enough to go into their pockets and give you money, which means they're really, they're really ready to engage. They're not just, anyone can like a picture. Anybody can, you know, click yes, like this is great. But when, when they're asked to actually give money and they do, that shows so much more engagement and that opens the eyes to labels and, uh, you know, people to like, say, well, this, this, this artist gets good engagement. Maybe we should take a look at them a little, a little deeper, you know? What is that fan who donates money? Maybe donate isn't the right word, but they help. They contribute. Fu- they contribute. Thank you. So they contribute to the crowdfunding. Typically, what do they get in return for that? I mean, I'm a fan. I love their music. I want to help you out. But is there is there some kind of quid pro quo that comes back or is it you know do they get a t-shirt or a cd or the name on the project or so the thing that also makes us different we talk with every single artist about what incentive is going to work best for them and the way that we have them go about it is we get their fan base involved beforehand we tell them to ask their fan base for five dollars what would you want in return for this so they can come to us and say okay so based off of this data they really want a digital download or they really want a shout out on instagram or something like that And we try to guide them where the incentive that they give not only matches the type of music brand that they already have out there, but it doesn't bleed into their pockets and the profit they're going to make off of it. Right. Because a lot of times artists will be like, "Okay, so we'll do a T-shirt for fifteen dollars and we'll do a ball cap for twenty five and we'll do this. And when we ask them if they already have that in their collateral pieces, they say, no, I have to order it. We remind them that then that cuts into the profit of what they're getting. So, yeah, merch isn't free. Merch is not free. And it is expensive sometimes if you aren't able to order it in bulk. So we help them figure out what's going to kind of resonate with their fan base before their campaign happens. And then they always are able to tailor it the way that they need to. 
crowdfunding when they come to you seeking a certain amount of money mm-hmm. and, and you've thrown some numbers out there, 5,000, 10,000, 30,000, is that money typically slated for, is the focus on recording a project or is it something to help launch a tour or a video campaign? Is it limited to just one thing or can it be used for a number of reasons? Everything that you just said and more. <laughs> We've had campaigns that um, have helped fund artists get from the city that they're in to the show that they wanted to go to or schedule a small tour around a city that they knew their artists were in, but they weren't in or even artists that just wanted to raise money for an, a single release, but they wanted to get into a quality studio. So the sky's the limit when it comes to figuring out what they need the money for. And a lot of times it's also not just needing the money, but how is that going to move your career forward as well? And I think that's an important aspect of it too, because asking for money, and and we touched really briefly on this earlier, but asking for the money and knowing what to do with it. Let's dig into that a little more. I'm an independent artist. I've got 10,000 fans and I want to record an album. Do you help them put the budget together? Do you help them find the resources? Or is that something they do on their own and you're just helping compile the monetary funding to get this launched? Well, I, I think it depends. You know, like um, like some artists, you know, are more self-contained. They know what they want to do. They have their team in place. They have their producer. They know what to record. They just need the funds to do it. Others, yeah, others don't know, you know, are really new and they just don't know what to do. So we'll sit down and talk to them and say, well, what do you want to do? What is your end goal? What would you like to have happen? And then based on that, we'll guide them and say, listen, that's the thing too. We guide these people. They don't necessarily listen, you know? So that's one of the things you got to say, you know, we guide them. We do our best to try to say, listen, this is what you should do, but not everybody will listen. So that's just so you know. So it depends on what they want to do. I, I can get back to what you said about what we do what they raised money for. We had one band whose van broke down and they needed to just get a new van so they can go back on tour, you know? So they just raised money to get a new van, you know? So, well, and I would say too, when it comes to figuring out what they want to do with the money, if they really don't have a clue and they, they don't necessarily have the context or connections, we try to help at least from our standpoint, open up the doors for them to people that we know could potentially help them. Now, that's not to say that we'll make the, like, we'll put them in and all of a sudden this relationship happens, but we'll guide them into how to start people their- like we can call, right? Yeah. And, and we'll guide them into how to nurture that relationship, how to talk to to these people and also help them and figure out how to research if there is a specific person that they've wanted to work with but haven't and we don't necessarily have that connection for we kind of guide them in building up their confidence to say well just because you haven't talked to them before doesn't mean that they can't help you so here's how you go about doing that because a lot of times Maybe, yeah. well, i was going to say a lot of times they'll come to us and say well i really want to work with this person but no one in my circle of artist friends has ever worked with this person and i don't have their contact information i don't really know what to do so we help guide them there because that, I, for some artists, can be scary and reaching out of their comfort zone. And maybe this isn't a great business model, but we've turned people away. <laughs> you no, know, no, we'll say, listen, you're not ready. You know, you, you don't really have a big enough fan base to do anything. Your music isn't, you know, I'll be honest, you know, that being the artist part of me, I say, listen, what you're doing, you, you, you know, like to get your music together better or get what you want to do better or, when, you know, put something, you know, you're not ready. And people don't want to listen, but fine. But, you know, I don't want to just take people's money. That's part of why we're doing this. Because I, as an artist myself, I find all these, like, there's so many of these companies out there that are gouging these artists for $3,000 a month fees to co-write, to do demos. And they're just gouging these people who aren't really ready, making them think they're doing something in the music industry when they're just spending money. Where We're like, I want to actually help you get somewhere. And if you're ready, I'll help you. But if you're not, go back and get ready before, you know. I am so glad to hear that because this is why the show is called the way it is. It is, there is a business side to this music industry. Mm -hmm. And if you're not ready, you need to get back in there and woodshed and get your chops together. Or it's much like the artist who wants to go into the recording studio, but doesn't have anything to record Mm -hmm. or has the songs to record, but they're not ready, has no idea how to arrange them, lay them out. And you have to be careful of putting the cart before the horse. You got to load the cart before you hitch the horse up to it and get down the road, right? Exactly. And it also comes back to 
you may think you're ready, but you're not. And if you take the advice of the people who are telling you that you're not ready to just go do those maybe couple of things to get you there, not only will it help you as a music music artist progress faster, but it'll also help you in delivering to your fan base. Because I think that's where some artists get caught up with, well, I know I'm ready, so I'm going to raise $5,000, I'm going to do this. But at the end of the day, if they can't show the tangible effort that they've been able to do recording-wise or video-wise or tour-wise to their fan base, that can put a bad taste in their fans' mouth. And they don't want to start off doing that because the second they do that, it's a trickle effect. And once you lose the trust of your fans, you won't be able to do the things you want to do with your career. It really does come down to your fans trusting you Mm -hmm. when you you start this process Mm -hmm. absolutely you have people like who've come in and wanted to raise fifteen thousand dollars they want to do a a video and a 10 song album i'm going listen listen, for when that you can't that can you don't have enough money to do that secondly why do you need 10 10 song album what's the point so i'll say maybe we'll say why don't you just do like a four song ep take four great songs and your fan base isn't enough to raise fifteen thousand dollars let's say Let's try to raise $6,000 and let's do a four song EP. And then once you get that done, we'll take it from there and see where you go from there. And like start like that. But these people want to come in and they want to do everything now. And I'm going to do this. And, and they don't have a clue, you know, because so that's what we try to help and guide people to do. And some listen and succeed, you know, some again, but then again, you know, some don't listen and succeed as well. But for the most part, they don't listen and they, it, they will kind of fall flat in their face uh, as we usually find, you know. In the studio with us, Nicole Hoagland, who's the executive director, and via Zoom, Carl Alaka, who's the CEO of MCR Crowdfund. You're listening to the business side of music. Whether you consider yourself a musician or not, music is all around us and it affects our everyday lives. Whether it's background music influencing our shopping habits in a store, organ music adding the vibe to a baseball game, or a playlist convincing us to keep going on that last mile of a run. I'm Mindy Peterson, host of the podcast Enhanced Life with Music, where we take a holistic look at music's benefits through the lens of science and medicine, entertainment, and business. You can find me and Enhanced Life with Music at mpetersonmusic.com slash podcast or wherever you get your audio. Since 1963, Korg has been creating new experiences in music and performance. That is what drove the creation of some of Korg's most legendary products, such as the Poly 6, the M1, the Electribe, the Triton, the Minilog, the Kronos, Wavestate, Op6, and most recently, the Nautilus, which is what we have here in our studio. Korg is dedicated to creating new, innovative, and uncompromising instruments which maintain the highest quality to inspire music makers, past, present, and future. Visit Korg.com or your favorite Korg dealer to get your hands on one of their products and start creating new music always. Korg, the official sponsor of the business side of music. You're listening to the business side of music. Back in the studio here in Nashville, Tennessee, Nicole Hoagland, who's the executive director, and Carl Alaco, who is joining us from New York, who's the CEO of MCR Crowdfund. We've talked about Carl is one of those guys such as myself that first came to Nashville in the 1980s when it was still this kind of this small music town and and now it's this big metropolis the music industry has really grown the same way the the music industry just used to be a bunch of good old boys in back rooms smoking cigars and cutting deals and it's become very metropolitan now the the whole music industry the artist that is getting out there and creating the crowdfunding, are they looking for success in their career? Are they just looking, you know, to kind of bootstrap themselves and get to the next level, whatever that next level is for them to get their career to keep moving forward? I would say both, because a lot of the times the first thing we ask them is, what does a successful music career look like to you? Because what what is that end goal for them? Is it a record deal? Is it a publishing deal? Is it just to literally live out the next 20 years playing the music that you love and making quality products for your fans? Right. And then there are people out there who literally just want to be kind of like that middle class musician that we're seeing now where they just want a career where they can make money from their fans. They can put out music and they can literally ride that throughout the pasture until their old age and their fans just don't want to hear them anymore. So I would say both 
types of artists can do crowdfunding, but the ones that we see have the more successful campaigns are the ones that know that this is moving the needle forward to that ultimate end goal for them. But you know, I find that's different. That's kind of odd. It's kind of a contradiction. The music industry has so much changed. Like you said, Bob, it's not what it used to be back in, you know, in, in the seventies, eighties and nineties. I think the day of the rock star is kind of over the way we used to know it, like selling multi platinum albums and making millions of dollars off your records. That's kind of gone for the most part. You know, some artists still do it, but not, not as many, not the way it used to be. But I think a lot of artists, even though the, the industry has changed, a lot of artists still see that goal, though, as if it's still there, like they want to be the rock star. So I think there's a kind of disconnect in what they're doing and what they're, they're trying to get to where they're going and to where they're going to get to. You know what I mean? They don't see the, the path. The path is just blurry right now. The landscape is just all over the place. It's the Wild West. So it's hard for artists. To, I don't know what I'd be doing if I was... 21 right now trying to like do this you know it's different than than when i was younger you know what i mean i love what you said there it's the wild west that's not the first time that's come up in a conversation on our show it definitely is the wild west out there because we've talked about this so many times when i started it was vinyl and then it was eight track and then it was cassette and then it was cd and then it was downloads and now it's streaming and of course that revenue chain as those formats change and we go in new directions, the revenue form, uh, the revenue stream has shrunk mm -hmm. and, there's, and there's less money out there. So we have to get creative. It is the Wild West. We have to- there's, 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 That money's still out there. It's just going different places. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's not going in the direction it used to go. Right, exactly. It's not going to the artist's pocket as much, right. So let's talk about how does an artist connect with MCR Crowdfund and what is expected from them to get the ball rolling. So they can find us, our website is mcrcrowdfund.com. They also can find us on Instagram at Music Careers Reimagined. That is at Music Careers Reimagined, all one MCR word. MCR stands for. Uh, yeah, that's what MCR stands for. But it was too long. So we just put MCR. <laughs> yeah, so we shortened it. But the expectation is this. When they want to start crowdfunding, make sure it's not an instantaneous idea, because if it's instantaneous and you just want to go for it and you slap it together and then you put it out to your fan base, it's not going to resonate. This is a plan that we know if you want to do something in the next six months, come to us and talk to us and we'll help you figure out your timeline for when you could start pre-promoting, what types of incentives, make sure that, you know, everything lines up correctly and that you have a dedicated 30 days to actually spend time promoting the actual crowdfunding campaign. And the expectation on the artist is once the campaign launches that they do start promoting it almost daily, if not more. Our expectation onto the artist is we will remind them to promote it and give them different ideas and help them in instances where they're feeling frustrated and, and to make sure that they keep going. And once they raise their money, whether they actually reach their goal or not, they get their money. It's not an all or nothing type deal. We may even grant an extension if you want to go a little longer because you think maybe you need a little more time. We also, again, give you whatever money you raise, whether as long as you can fulfill your incentives, we'll give you your money. And also our fee is cheaper than GoFundMe, which is like 7% and Kickstarter, which is 6%. Our fee is 5%. So it's even, we take less money to do it. I want to touch on something real quick before we end, and that's the setup mm -hmm. of the crowdfund. Because we talk about, well, you know, you, you do the crowdfund and it's 30, 45 days long. How much time should the artist or what do you recommend, either one of you, the setup time for this before you pull the trigger? I would say a minimum two weeks. We are more comfortable with a month. So I would say if they're a month out, we start the conversation and two weeks before they launch the campaign, they start pre-promoting and talking about it with their um, fan community because their fans need to also be warmed up to the fact that they need to open up their pockets and, you know, give that 10 to $20 donation or, you know, more in case they are a super fan. So. Right. And then how far ahead should they be coming to you? Sh just two weeks before? Or? I, no, I would say they should be either four to six weeks out from when they want to launch gotcha. their campaign. Come talk to us. They because have everything together. They have everything together. And they know what they want to do and they have all their incentives together and they've done their homework and they and they contact us. That's nothing too, but if they contact us on a Monday and they have everything together and they seem like they know what they want to do, 
we can get a campaign up in in two days if, if need be. So it all depends on individual act. I would say on average, like four to six weeks out from when they do want to do something just so that we give them time to get everything together, because it's it's also one of those things. We need photos from them. We need a video from them. We go back and forth on incentives just to make sure that they're the right incentives for their audience. So it is a process and it's not just a fill out this form and we put it up and they go. So which is what Kickstarter is. And they just, you know, you go online, you just fill out a form with no guidance and then put it up. That's it. Yeah. Hope mm-hmm. for the best. Carl, Nicole, thank you so much. No, thank you so much for having us. Thank you, Bob. Really appreciate it. The business side of music is the creation of Tom Sabella and Tracy Snow and is produced by Bob Bender. The business side of music is recorded at Music Dog Studios in Nashville, Tennessee. Production sound design by Keith Stark. Voiceover and promo by Lisa Fuson. Never had one lesson. This tape will self-destruct in five seconds.